Hi everybody and welcome back. We have a really interesting video today and uh, where it all started was I was watching YouTube as normal a while back and I was watching a channel by the name of Glasslinger. Some of you may have seen Ron's channel, um, Glasslinger. He does a lot of videos on uh, old tube electronics. Uh, he actually makes vacuum tubes he actually makes his own tools and test equipment. Uh, he built his own glass turning lathe so that he can make his own vacuum tube bulbs. Really fascinating stuff that he does. And uh, every time he comes out with a new video, it's something different and it's something very interesting. He's a wealth of knowledge and very interesting to watch. So in a few of his episodes, he showed this little box that he called the electronic circuit breaker. And it's basically a thing that you, when you're working on an old radio, especially like old tube radios and so forth, and you want to protect it without actually putting it on like a dim bulb tester or running it at full voltage instead of on a variac to see how it works, this thing will actually monitor the current and you can set the trip point for what current you want it to trip and you can set how many AC cycles from two cycles up to 32 cycles that, that it will wait of over current before it'll trip and it'll drop a relay out and um, it'll shut it off and then you can hit reset to reset it. It's a really neat circuit. I will put a link down below the video here to his original video. Um, it's really awesome. Anybody who's into uh, elect old electronics, or new electronics for that matter, um, this is a great tool to have on your bench. Um, it's a way that you can apply full power to a device and still have that protection of if something shorts out or something starts to run away and go into an overcurrent situation, it will immediately cut the power. So I got to thinking I would love to have one of those and he shared a lot of information of how to build one on his channel and he showed us a schematic which I captured off the screen as he suggested and printed out which we'll look at that here in a minute and then I kind of studied it for about a week or two and then kind of put a little bit of changes uh, some things that that uh, I would like to add to it so this video is all about me building the Glasslinger electronic circuit breaker and uh, kind of putting my own little spin on it. So if that sounds interesting to you, stay tuned and that's what we're going to be doing today. So here's the original circuit as Ron designed it and as he shared with us on that video that he did. Again, I can't say enough good things about Ron on Glasslinger's channel there. He does a great job and I learn, I learn something every time I watch one of his videos. Very entertaining and uh, very educational. So anyway, here's essentially what it's doing. He has a current transformer and so here's your power coming in, here's your outlet going out. So you kind of see it's basically, uh, with the exception of these relay contacts, it's a straight through circuit with just a set of contacts breaking the circuit. And this little transformer, you can buy these and I'll share with you um, a few different ones that I have. Um, and I'll show you, I did something a little bit different. We'll, we'll get into that here in a minute. But essentially all this is, is a little toroid. And it is not your normal ferrite toroid because a lot of the ferrite toroids depending on the, the compound that they, that they make them out of, uh, they don't work at line frequency. In other words, your mains line is either 50 or 60 hertz. And a lot of the toroids that you find out there are high frequency. They run at kilohertz or even megahertz. So the first thing you need to do if you're going to get one of these is either purchase a pre-made one of these or you have to write, get the right compound of ferric material uh, to wind your own and I suggest highly ag against trying to wind your own. Uh, the, the main part that your power line goes through as you can see is only one turn but 
this secondary is somewhere around 2,000 turns. So if you want to wind that <laughs> thread thread that wire through that hole 2,000 times, uh, you, you got a lot more willpower than I do. But you can buy these and I'll give you some sources and things. But anyway, all this does is it converts voltage to current to a voltage to a representative voltage that represents current. So what that means is, for instance, the one that, that Ron used, if you pass 15 amps of current through this little wire here, you'll get approximately 8 volts AC out of the secondary. Now that's really important because that's setting up your reference. And it's, re and it's pretty linear, so it, you know, at 15 amps you'll have 8 volts, at 7.5 amps you should have somewhere around 4 volts usually. But what you'll find is because of the permeability of this core and so forth, it's not going to be completely linear all the time. So it's not perfect. So you kind of have to design that into your comparator circuit. What he does from there is, that's how, that's how we monitor the current non-invasively. If you notice, this, this wire is an insulated wire, and it passes right through this little donut hole without touching any wires electrically, because everything's insulated. And then you get this inductively coupled um, signal out, which is a low voltage, and then he feeds it into this little op amp comparator circuit and this is essentially just a basic <laughs> LM311 comparator that's a very old chip um, you can find them just about anywhere um, you can buy them they if you pay more than 50 cents or so for it uh, you're probably spending too much so they're very inexpensive and very readily available and by adjusting the gain and so forth on this, he's he's setting up a reference between this 8 volt signal, 0 to 8 volts we should say, and a reference that's being generated down here. And you can see this pot is actually adjusting a range of voltages. So you have, if you turn it all the way down, that'll be the minimum voltage that will trip this, and turn it all the way up, that'll be the maximum voltage that will trip the op, or the uh, comparator. So essentially, when these things, when one gets higher than the other, this will go either high or low, depending on if you're using the inverting or the non-inverting inputs. Okay, Look up comparator online. There's all kinds of uh, information on it. Uh, you can refer to reference books. Um, again, like The Art of Electronics, uh, that's one that we always talk about here. But if you go online and you just do a simple Google search of comparator circuit, op-amp comparator circuit, you'll find tons of information on them. They're very simple to build and uh, very easy to get working. So the idea is this is going to set the voltage that this is going to match to. So for instance, if you want this thing to trip at 15 amps, you would set this reference here to 8 volts, right, because 8 volts equals 15 amps, and then when 15 amps passes through here, you'll get an output of 8 volts, and that 8 volt peak will go into here, and when this meets or exceeds this, this thing's going to go high, or it's going to go low depending on inverting or non-inverting. Again, we can wire it either way. Now, here's the problem. The output of this is alternating current. It's AC. But this thing likes, only looks at direct current. In other words, it only looks at positive voltages. So what does an AC voltage do? Well, if I find a pencil, I will show you. So the signal that comes out of here goes positive and then goes negative because remember your mains voltage is alternating right and the current is going to alternate with the voltage so 
as the current is passing through this back and forth the output of this is going to change back and forth and because this only looks at positive voltage when this voltage is higher than this one then it's only going to look at this portion of the waveform when you go to the negative portion of the waveform it doesn't matter how far off it is this is going to ignore it because a negative voltage is still less than this positive voltage no matter what this positive voltage is so it can only look at half of the waveform that's how this circuit is designed for that so in order to change that there's different things you can do like you could put a bridge rectifier but then you're gonna have to deal with two voltage drops of two diodes which is going to cut a whole lot of signal off of this and it's going to affect it negatively. You really don't want to do that. Uh, so I have another solution. We'll get into that later. But anyway, that's how this circuit works here. Now, when we come out of this, each time your current exceeds your trip point that you set down here with this pot so this pots on the front if you watch his video you'll see what I'm talking about this thing is going to change states and each time this change states from a positive to a negative and then back up that's going to equal one clock pulse on this chip and this chip is a counter it's a, a CD 4040 and it is another very old chip and it's a counter circuit so it's going to count this is ever this is twos fours eights sixteens and thirty twos it's binary right it's a binary counter and so every time you do two clock pulses this one will click then when you hit four pul clock pulses this one will go high when you hit eight pulses this one will go high and so forth and it counts through so by selecting which output you're looking at if you do two full cycles that's over current two full cycles meaning the positive and the negative and then the positive and the negative or one and a half cycles depending on where it starts you're going to get your two pulses and this thing's going to trip so if this is connected up here this MOSFET right here will then gate on when it gates on it takes this low side of this relay coil and brings it to ground and pulls in the relay when the relay pulls in notice he's using the normally closed contacts so what's going to happen is it's going to release those so it's going to they're going to fall away so that's how this thing works now again this is a really cool circuit how this works but there's a few things that I'm concerned about a little bit if you have a really bad severe short which I don't really think it would happen because of how fast this circuit reacts but theoretically you could cause these little contacts to flash a little bit which could eventually cause pitting and eventually cause them to weld shut or to not work right now you know if you use it like you're supposed to on little radios and things that probably will never happen on larger items where you have a really serious hard short it could happen the other thing is the way this is using the normally closed contacts its failure mode is to fail closed meaning if I pulled the plug out of this power supply so this whole circuit is no longer powered then this thing would be closed and you would have a complete circuit through here and no way for the circuit to break other than this 15 amp breaker up here and 15 amp breakers take a very long time they have to heat up for a while before they'll trip so <laughs> you can damage a lot of components before a breaker will actually go out so a couple things with that but for the most part this is a great circuit and its simplicity um, is amazing how simple this thing is and yet it works um, the rest of this down here is just providing power so if you take a 12 volt or 24 volt center tapped transformer 
and you rectify it and you can see how he has it wired for positive and negative he has a split voltage so you have a plus and minus it's roughly going to be 16 volts give or take um, this circuit needs a positive and negative voltage rail so he's pulling that off of there and it's unregulated which doesn't matter then he regulates it through a 7812 um, linear voltage regulator to get a clean 12 volt signal and then he's using that 12 volts as a very clean signal for the reference voltage to set the trip current so right here's where your 12 goes in and you have a pull-up resistor here through this 22k onto the output of this LM311 and then it's going to go low when this trips and then you're going to also feed that 12 volts through here and set up your reference voltage to set your maximum and minimum current and he chose these resistance values based on the components that he had and he was using and you may have to change these a little bit depending on what kind of current sensor you use so that's the crux of this now I kind of studied this for a long time because you know I I'm like that <laughs> I'm a nerd I like electronics and I can stare at things like this for a long time and it's just as interesting to me as when when other people read a really good book or something this is this gives I get the same interest out of studying schematics and things I know I'm a nerd I'll admit it guilty as charged anyway <laughs> so after studying it I decided I'm gonna try a couple different things and see if I can modify this and add a couple things to it so I'm gonna take you somewhat through the evolution of this thing and oh I forgot um, another thing this this doesn't do anything to the circuit but this is one of those little you can buy them on eBay or Amazon it's another little toroid that goes through the wire and all it is is a display unit that can display um, it's kinda like a, those kilowatt units except it's built in it's a panel mount thing and it lets you display the voltage the current the wattage the uh, power factor all kinds of cool things and he uses this meter to set the trip point so he'll drive the current up that to uh, you know till this reads a certain current that he wants to set it to and then he'll adjust this pot till it trips the breaker or trips the relay and then that's how he marked all of the graduations on the knob that's connected to this so that you know what you know what each where to set the knob for each trip point of you know in amps so anyway and I'm using that too I think it's a great idea so the first thing you'll notice is instead of using that little toroid I'm using a little bit different device and it's actually a, an active current sense module and it works off of the Hall effect and they're really neat little devices and believe it or not you can scavenge these things from old uh, UPS you know uninterruptible power supplies for computers those things are everywhere nowadays um, if you work in a computer lab or you work in an office building that uses those um, or anything like that or, or even if you have one that's not working anymore most of them will have one of these it, it who knows what type it'll be but most of them will have one of these or they'll have the more basic type that I'll show you here in a second but anyway this one has an advantage over the analog one or analog well this is analog too but over the just the transformer type in that it has an electronic circuit and it actually will output an extremely stable and extremely linear voltage that represents the current and the really cool thing is it starts off at an offset voltage and if the voltage moves up from that offset voltage it's a positive going current and if it goes the opposite direction it's a negative going current so it can display both halves of your cycle positive and negative it, and uh, well I'll show you the data sheet here in a little bit but uh, let's start out with the basic one because I want you to see what these things look like 
So here's a similar one that I have that's kind of similar to the one that Ron uses on his circuit. And this is just a current sense transformer. And you can see that's really what they call them. And inside here is just a little toroid with the correct type of metal. And you'll see three wires. And if you look here, here is your, there's your circuit. And you basically have two of them that will be tied together. If you look at it this way, you can see down here, pin one would be the top of the winding, and then pins two and three are tied together to this bottom winding. And this is actually your wire. So you would take your piece of wire coming from your outlet and you would pass it through like that. And as current passes through there, it will induce a voltage on these pins. Now, this particular one is rated for a maximum current of 20 amps. So you could use this up to 20 amps, which is really cool. It's got a thousand to one turns ratio, so there are 1,000 turns of wire, of really hair thin wire in there on the secondary. And passing this through here once, that is one turn. Okay? This is not one turn. Okay? Whenever you're talking about a toroid, that would be two turns. Every time a wire passes through the center, that equals one turn. So, right there is one turn. And your your terminating resistor should be 100 ohms at 40 milliwatts. Okay, so it can be a little tiny resistor. And terminating resistors are very important for this circuit, as you'll see in a minute. The actual DC resistance of this is 40 ohms of this secondary. Now, here's really the important part. If you look at this, if you have a 100 ohm impedance or 100 ohm termination across these pins and you read across it with a very high impedance circuit like an op amp or an oscilloscope or something, then what you're going to get is 0 0.0977 volts, okay, so 97.7 millivolts would equal one amp. Not very much, is it? So, even with 10 amps, you're only going to get 977 millivolts. So you won't even get one volt out with 10 amps. So you can see we're talking about very teeny tiny little voltages that we're looking at on this. So you have to have a very sensitive and very accurate voltage reference and a very accurate comparator circuit for this to work. So. That's why you're using a regulated power supply for that. You don't want it to, to change. Even, a, even millivolts would throw it off by sometimes amps. So, but it's very linear. All the way from 0 to 20 amps, you will get 0 .0977 volts for each amp of current flowing through the wire here. Does that make sense? Very simple. Now let's look at what I'm going to use. And by the way, um, these sometimes if you look at those uninterruptible power supplies and things like that, they'll use this as well. But some of them will use the better type that I'm going to show you here. So just just so you know. All right, so this is what I'm going to use. And this is called a Hall effect current sensor. As you can see, it's got three pins on this side, three pins on this side, and three pins on the edge. And if you notice, you have a plus five volt power supply you have to feed into it with ground, and then you actually have a signal out. And these are your actual terminals. You can actually wire them in parallel, or you can do different wiring diagrams to, to get different reference outputs. It's, it's configurable very cool but essentially you don't pass anything through it you actually solder your wires right onto there and there's actually a Hall effect sensor in here and a little 
amplifier circuit. Now, here's the cool thing. When you turn this thing on, it will output a constant 2.5 volts it, when no current is flowing. So zero current is 2.5 volts. That's called an offset because it's not at zero, right? So the output voltage is offset from your input current by 2.5 volts. And the output voltage at maximum current, rated current, so for instance there's three versions of this thing, a 6 amp, a 15 amp, and a 25 amp. This one here is the 25 amp that we're looking at. So at 25 amps of current flowing through here in this wire and out this wire, you will get an, a difference of 0.625 volts. What that means is if I have current flowing positive this direction, I will get 2.5 plus 0.625, or I will get 3.125 volts, or 3 and a quarter volts, at 25 amps. And vice versa, if I go negative voltage going the current flowing the opposite direction, it will be 2.5 volts minus 0.625 volts. And the thing is, that's your full scale. It's very, very linear. And if you go down here, they have a chart. So they show you an, exa an example chart for the 25 amp version of this, okay? But this chart's very similar for, for all three, except the voltages are different. And you can see on this one, at zero amps of current, you get 2.5 volts out of this pin right here. And you can see it's very linear because at 25 amps, or at 20 amps, you're getting exactly 3 volts. And at 25 amps, if you were able to plot that, you're getting right up there at your 2.6, or uh, yeah, 3.125 volts. So 3.125 at 25 amps. And you can see, so you can actually interpolate. You can just use math, use basic linear interpolation, and you'll know what exact voltage will equal what exact current. And it's very accurate. And the other cool thing about this is from the instant that the current starts flowing through this, or the change in current flows, it will react and change the output of this within about one microsecond. And I think they show, yeah, one microsecond. So the response time is very quick on this thing. So what that means is if you get a real heavy fast short, this is going to register that immediately. And really the only thing that's your limiting factor is the speed at which the relay can drive and all that. So you can see I modified this to use one of these modules and then I had to change the circuit a little bit. Now don't start copying this because this this was my rough draft. This was where I took and kind of copied what Ron did and started modifying it very slightly. So then I got to thinking well, you still have a problem here because it's still not going to look at the negative voltage. Now, since you have a 2.5 volt offset, we never have to worry about negative voltage. But it's still not going to trip this. It's only going to trip it when your reference, which is set by the pot back there, um, equals your, uh, you know, your reference, where did I put the pot here? I think I, I see, I, did, I was working on this. I didn't even finish this. It's only going to, it's still going to work like the original design. So we don't get the benefit of this other than the linearity and the accuracy. So that's where I started making some more changes. And I'll just skip way ahead and I'll show you the finished product. 
So after I did a, a whole bunch of erasing and tracing and overwriting and redrawing, I finally got it where I wanted and I went on to KiCad and I kind of plotted this out really fast. <laughs> and if you look at it, and I should have printed this on that green paper so it would show up better on the video. But if you look, I've completely changed it. So let's, let's go and see what we've gotten here. So the first thing we'll do is I'll slide up here. This is not anatomically correct because KiCad did not have a symbol for this. So I just kind of showed it as a current sense transformer and I added a couple lines to it. But just imagine this being this. And here's your input and output wires here. And then down here is your pins for that. And this is your output pin, which is this out V out right there. See it? So that would equal this wire right here. And if we slide down here, we really changed things, didn't we? <laughs> so we no longer have an LM311. We no longer have a positive and negative power supply. We just have a positive going only power, single rail power supply. Because this will run on just a single rail power supply, as will this. And we're now using an LM358 which is a dual op amp chip. And what this circuit is called, do you guys recognize this? I bet you a bunch of you know it. It's a window comparator. What is a window comparator? Well, a regular comparator, as you remember from the last schematic, only has one of these op amps, and it can only measure against one voltage and whether it either gets higher than that voltage or lower than that voltage, you know, the, it, when these two are compared, um, based on whether you're using the inverting or non-inverting input. But what this does is this actually allows you to monitor a window of voltages. So as long as that voltage fluctuates within a range, a set range of these set by these two pins here, these two wires here, the output doesn't change. But as soon as it goes above this voltage or below this voltage, so this is the low voltage set, this is the high voltage set, as soon as it gets outside of that range, this will toggle. This will go high. So it stays low until one of these goes out of range and then it goes high. And <clears throat> so you say to yourself, well now I need a reference voltage that I adjust two voltages at the same time and I want the voltage, the high voltage to go higher and the low voltage to go lower so the 2.5 volts always stays in the center, right? Because 2.5 volts is zero. So if we just adjusted the whole overall voltage range, it would do this, right? And it's going to defeat the purpose. So we want to adjust the positive voltage more positive and the negative more negative at the same time, right? And we want it to be centered around 2.5 volts. And at first you might think, how in the heck are you going to do that? You know, you're going to need all these op amps and all these reference voltages and... Nope. Very simple. We use two resistors and a pot and we're going to set... This is called a variable voltage divider. And all we do is these two resistors are equal. If you notice, they're 220 ohms. And I'm feeding my 5 volts uh, reference into there. And by breaking the center point, so if I put 5 volts here, I'll have exactly 2.5 volts here in the middle if this pot wasn't in here. Like if this was turned all the way up, so you're essentially shorting this out, that would be 2.5 volts. And if you notice, the wiper is tied down here. And this upper voltage, the upper threshold, is set up here. So the more I add resistance between these two, the center point, the more it's going to spread these two voltages apart with reference to 2.5 volts, right? Very simple, right? Bob's your uncle. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do here. And then the problem is to get a one-turn pot, to be accurate because you're you're talking you're just moving this millivolts at a time really there's no pot that would give you the full amount of range without giving you 
and still be able to give you the, the really fine amount of adjustment. So by putting this extra shunt resistor here and a little switch, we can change the range in here by, uh, by shunting this out and making this a lower value and making a smaller range that's more adjustable within that range. Does that make sense? So that's all this is doing. Window comparator. Look it up. Interesting stuff, isn't it? <laughs> I lay awake at night thinking about this stuff sometimes. It's fascinating. Now, once we come out of here, they tie together. This is the output. And this part is essentially the same. So you have your clock. And this is going to go high instead of dropping low. And then when it drops back out, this will click one clock pulse. Um, and we're going to have to test this and make sure this works properly because I may want to make some changes here. But for now, that's what we're going to do. And uh, then you still have your reset circuit. That's the same as the original. And then we have an output. And again, the only symbol I could find for a rotary tap switch was a 12 position. But really, there's only five positions here. There's seven, six, five, three, and two. Those are the only pins that he uses for the 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32 pulses. So that's all this represents. No biggie. Very basic power supply with a 12 volt and a 5 volt. And I use a different option on mine. And I'll show you that also in a minute. That's even more accurate. Because these LM7805s, they can be not quite 5 volts. Sometimes they can be 5.05 .05 or 5.1. They can drift a wee little bit from one, one chip to the next. So we're going to use something a little better. Still using our MOSFET. The MOSFET then is going into a very interesting little device here called a zero-crossing triac opto-isolator. And uh, any of you who work with any AC power circuits would recognize what this is. This is an optically isolated uh, driver chip for driving a triac. So essentially this is just a, a LED inside here. And when the LED turns on, it's, it gates this little teeny mini triac and it waits till the AC signal is going through a zero crossing. In other words, it's not going to let this big triac here fire until you're going from a positive going to a negative going cycle. As you're crossing through the zero volt line, that's when this thing will fire off and it'll turn this on nice and soft because of that. Then this triac acts as your relay. So it'll, it'll gate on and it will allow the current to flow through the wire and up into your outlet, which is just a standard, we're just going to use a standard outlet. And in addition to that, let's say we want to be able to use a dim bulb tester. I built that provision in here as well. In line with your AC line, so here's your AC line going all the way here, down through here. I have it going through a light bulb socket, just like a dim bulb. And I just have a 100 watt light bulb in there. And then I have this switch to bypass it. So this will be full power when it's closed, and it'll be current limited when it goes through here. So we can still use the dim bulb as well. That gives us all kinds of options with this box. So we can run it at full power with, you know, very fast acting circuit breaker tripping, or we can use the dim bulb tester to run the circuit under, you know, under current limited conditions so that you can troubleshoot it. Because sometimes you want the short circuit to be powered <laughs> through that bulb so that you can, as you pull things out of the circuit, you can watch the bulb get dimmer and, and so forth. So that's a good troubleshooting tool as well. So by having both of these, this and this circuit back here, this is really a great benchtop troubleshooting tool. So in theory, that's it. <laughs> uh, now, <laughs> will it work? Well, I have been doing quite a bit of breadboarding. 
so I've wired up several different circuits um, this is the original one and then I went through and I mocked up everything up to this point and then I just kind of quickly hacked that onto one of these little uh, project boards and uh, I'll turn it on and I'll kind of show you how it works okay first to give you the nickel tour um, here's your little LM358 and here's our little power supply circuit for the 12 volts with our little bridge rectifier and I have a little project transformer out here and then this is one of those buck regulators this is a very accurate regulator that you can adjust and I have it being driven by the 12 volt supply and I have it adjusted very precisely to exactly 5 volts and then we have our little voltage divider circuit down here these little blue resistors are those little 220 ohm resistors that we were talking about now as a proof of concept I just connected this little LED through a current limiting resistor to this output here so instead of having our clock I just hooked that LED there to show you when this trips so if I and right here is that pot that represents this down here and you can see the shunt resistor to change the range of it so let's let's plug it in so if we plug it in you can see the little ignore this that's just telling you that the 5 volt regulator is on but you can see the green LED is turned on right now and that's because there's nothing on the input so we have 5 volts going in there as a reference or 2.5 volts I'm sorry 2.5 volts as a reference and nothing on the input wire so I have nothing going into this wire right here which would be coming down from your current sense module so right here is my my power supply and I have the power supply set to exactly 2.5 volts and when I connect it here you can see the light goes out so see that now if I raise the voltage above 2.5 at 2.9 volts it comes on if I go back down to 2.5 it goes off if I go below oh, it goes it doesn't do anything because I don't have the range set so now let's turn this pot the whole way down or the whole way up I should say okay turn it all the way down if I go below 2.5 it kicks on if I go back up to 2.5 it kicks off and back up and it kicks on so you could see 2.5 2.4 2.5 again 2.7 so that is how a window comparator works if that makes sense so that's going to represent the output of this so this wire will be connected to this pin right here so proof of concept so originally I was just gonna go ahead and kinda hack out this whole thing on one of these project boards like this and it's kind of a pain and if you need to change out components they're hard to remove and I really really hate designing circuit boards I can't tell you how much I dislike doing that <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was bored one evening and there's nothing good on television as normal so I started tinkering around with KiCad and I ended up coming out coming up with this yes it is a completed circuit plan and this is what it's gonna look like and I 
go ahead. I went ahead and I printed myself out a board. Now I'll take you really briefly through my process of printing a circuit board. So the type of method I use to print circuit boards is called the toner transfer method. And in order to do that, you need a, a at least you need a laser printer that uses the toner cartridges. Um, very important because the toner that they use in laser printers has a high content of, of a type of plastic. And that plastic actually works really well as, as an etching mask. So the first thing you do is you set up the printer to print just the circuit board, the, the traces, without printing out any of the screens or any of that stuff, which is easy to do from KiCad. Then what you want to do is you print it on this special paper. This is called toner transfer paper. You can buy this online. Um, and if you notice, it's very shiny. And if you feel it, it almost feels like there's a coating of wax on it. It's so glossy that it actually feels like wax on there. And the toner doesn't stick to this very well, which that's the whole point. Now, little tech tip. If you don't have this or you don't want to purchase this, you can go to any bookstore or, or newsstand and buy a magazine that has the glossy pages in the magazine and you can use the page, just tear the pages out of the magazine and they actually work fairly well for this. Now the ink will not release, the toner does not release from those pages as easily or as clearly as it does from this special toner transfer paper but it does work and if you work on it long enough you can eventually get it to do it. So once you do that you want to get a piece of your copper clad board. So just imagine this board as having copper on it still and you just simply put it on a very flat surface preferably like a piece of plywood like this works really well and then you take your your print like this and you lay it down and center it over the paper and you really need to have a bright light so you can kind of see through it a little bit like that just put a bright light on and you can line it up like that and then I actually take a piece of aluminum just a sheet of very very flat aluminum this is actually a cover plate off of one of those old Radio Shack um, project boxes, plastic project boxes with the aluminum plate. It's very flat and it's actually relatively thick aluminum or aluminium, however you want to say it. And you very carefully lay it straight down on top like that. Now because of my fear and healthy respect for SWMBO, when she is not at home I sneak upstairs and I borrow the iron. <laughs> <laughs> and I take the iron and I plug it in and I just sit it right on top like that. I don't move it. I don't do anything. I just sit it on top, plug it into the wall, let it heat up to full temperature. And you just turn it on hot and just let it sit there for a couple of minutes and just kind of put a little bit of pressure on it. Don't slide it around. Just kind of hold pressure till it gets good and hot. Of course, you don't want to catch things on fire, <laughs> but just enough to get some heat. And once it's thoroughly heated, you remove the iron like that. This plate will be so hot it will blister your skin if you touch it. So you have to use a pair of pliers or something, but you want to slide this off without moving the paper. And then what you'll see underneath is you'll see that the glue, the uh, tracks are somewhat fused to the copper. Then what you want to do is very carefully, you want to hold the paper and kind of take a flat spudger or something. I use the back of this little exacto chisel, but you can use a plastic spudger. And you're just going to kind of wipe this down just to make sure it sets that ink or that toner onto the plastic or I mean onto the uh, copper clad and once you do that you're just gonna very gently slide it off and when you're done 
you'll have your little print on there like that except there'll be all the copper in there. I'll show you my etching tank here. Okay here's my etching tank and you can see the top comes off there's some little clips and you can kind of hang the board down in. If you notice this if you, when you were a kid, if you ever had an ant farm, you remember the little ant farm that you'd buy? You'd fill it up with sand and you'd put the ants in there and they'd cut and make the little tunnels and you could watch it. This is similar to an ant farm. If you look, it's just a thin container, except it has this little tube going down inside and with little perforations in the bottom. And you connect an aquarium air pump. And when you and it also has a, an aquarium heater in it so you plug the heater in you plug the aquarium pump in which agitates the solution and this is I use ferric chloride and you run that and it makes it really warm and it agitates it and I'll tell you what it takes the copper off that board in really short order it's actually really fast so you can buy these little kits. They come with a thermometer um, and you want it to be somewhere 30 to 40 degrees C. Um, you, you'll heat it up to. And uh, you can buy these kits. Uh, I think uh, I bought this at an electronics store next to one of my customers. It was a big place and it was really nice. I loved this place. They had all kinds of old things there. Um, every kind of component you could think of. And in 2016 the place caught on fire and the business was lost. But uh, up until that point that's where I bought this very inexpensively. But you can order these on Jameco, J-A-M-E-C-O dot com. I think they still sell these. There are several places that sell these and it's basically called a PC board etching tank or PC board etching kit. So that's what I use. And once you're done, the etchant will eat away all the copper except the copper that's underneath the toner. Now, once that's done, I wait once again until my wife is not home and I steal her nail polish remover. <laughs> oh, that woman is awesome for putting up with me. And we take the nail polish remover, and this is just acetone is all this is. And you can see it cleans right off. Just like that. So I'm going to wipe this all off and the board will be ready to drill. Now all I'm going to do is I'll go through with a drill and a tiny drill bit. And when I say tiny, it's tiny. <laughs> and I'm going to drill out all those holes. And then once this is drilled out, um, because I, one of the things when you use the toner transfer method, you're never going to get really crisp lines. They're going to be kind of raggedy. So if you look really close, you get some raggedy edges. And that's just the nature of it. That's just how it works. This one turned out pretty good. And I did go over, you're going to find out this toner doesn't always transfer perfectly. So you have to go with a uh, permanent marker such as this. Just a permanent marker. And I kind of will trace over uh, some of the sections that didn't catch as well just, just for extra precaution. And then, uh, again, that just ensures that you get a better, you know, a better etch. But it will leave it a little bit jaggedy looking, but who cares, you know, it works. And then what I do is I'll get my soldering iron. And uh, I'll just go ahead and I'll tin this. I'll tin all the tracks just kind of like that. And I'll just go right down the line and do the whole thing like that. For these little projects, not bad. Now, once this is done, if it really works well, I'll actually send the Gerber files for this. I'll, I'll plot it, and I can send it out to JLC or somebody and, and have them make me up some professional ones. But for now, proof of concept, this is fine. Oops. 
now the circuit is working properly. This is why we do things, um, kind of make a prototype board at home before we send anything out to be printed because on here I made two mistakes. Number one, well actually I made several mistakes. So first of all, this should not be the plus five volts. This should be the, the low side that goes to ground on this resistor. And this side here that's going to ground uh, needs to be um, actually going to the plus 5 volts. So they need to be swapped around and where that is is up here and even my schematic may be a little bit incorrect but basically what we're saying here is that on these two resistors on the board I need to swap these two two circuits around. So it's pretty simple to do on uh, KiCad to fix it and on the board itself I just kind of cut the one track for the ground and then swapped the wires around and it was perfect, no problem. Another thing I noticed is I went off the, the dimensions on the actual uh, spec sheet, that the data sheet for this current sense module, but actually these three pins here for the power, you know, the plus five volts and ground and the output signal this actual set of pins here needs to move out a little bit so I'll fix that as well and then this jumper instead of going from here to here the jumper actually needs to go from here to here I misrepresented that so a couple tiny little repairs but now the circuit is working properly you can see with 2.5 volts and I'll just kind of show you my power supply up here it's just this one up here and when it's within its little range, right here, right about 2.5 volts, <clears throat> we can see down here, I just put a little indicator light and the voltage. And you can see if I turn it up a little bit, you can see when I go above the threshold, it comes on, come back down to 2.5 and it goes off. I go below the threshold and it comes back on. So now it's working as it should and yes I'm loading this circuit more than I should that's why the voltage is dropping so much but that's that's normal because once again this is only a signal level it's not really designed to drive an LED that requires you know 20 milliamps of current or so. So if I disconnect this you can see the voltage goes back up to 9 volts. So there you go. The circuit is working. Now we're ready to move on to the next section, which is the actual counter. And we're going to, te we're going to test that now and see how it works. So you can see now I have the CD4040 binary counter chip installed. <clears throat> and I have the little reset switch to reset it back to zero and I still have my voltage right up here set at 2.5 volts and what we're going to do is I'm just going to take the knob here and I'm going to vary this up and down through that 2.5 volts as it counts the pulses. So the first thing we're going to look at is the two pulses and let me get uh, set up here and I'll show you what I'm doing. Okay, hopefully there's not too much glare on this meter. All right, so we get on here, and you can see it's tripped right now. So if I push the little button, if I can get my finger on it, <laughs> this is one of those little tactile buttons. And it resets it. Now if I turn this up and down through this 2.5 volts a couple times, you're going to see it trip. And you see there it went. I went up above and then down below and those two pulses tripped it. And you can see it's on. And then if we hit reset again. Now if we go to, let's say, the 8 count, which I think is the... Yeah, here. 
right here. I think it's the third one down. And now we have to run it through eight times. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm not holding the probe on there right. Let's reset it. Okay. Better job this time. Okay, here we go. And see, it takes a little bit more time. And there it goes. And that's after eight pulses. So, the verdict is the circuit is working. So now we know everything up to this point right here is working. So we're getting a valid output and uh, coming out of here. So now, <clears throat> I'm sorry, let me look through here. So now coming out of here, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to fit our little MOSFET and see if our little MOSFET circuit is going to trigger this triac, or the triac driver, I should say. Okay, we have everything hooked up except for the feedback from this little module here, although it is in the circuit now. Um, instead of it controlling it, because of course if we did that I'd have to put excessive current through there to get it to trip, um, we're just going to simulate that by using our five or our 2.5 volt power supply and driving it up and down. So as you can see it's reset right now and if I vary the voltage and I get enough counts you'll see the bulb come on. And uh, <laughs> shield your eyes because it's going to get bright here on the camera. And there it goes. And there it is. And to reset it, well, that's it. Very simple. So uh, it's working. So now really the only thing left to do is to actually try um, the overcurrent situation, but we're getting much closer. Um, I did have to change a few things in the circuit. And I'll go over that once I get everything done here at the end. But as you can see, it's working. Well, here's the whole enchilada. And right now it's tripped. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset it. So get ready for bright lights. And then when I reset it, I'm actually going to put excessive current by adding this second bulb across the first bulb. So let me do this around the camera and not electrocute myself. So there are the lights on. And when I touch the second bulb, if you noticed right here, it flashed very quickly. So it did, it did let it go over current for a short while, but then it, it reset and tripped, it tripped. So let me turn it back on. Here we go again. And there you go. And again, I have it set just a little bit over. Do it again. And you can see it trips it right away. So our circuit works. Now, what I'm going to do before I stop this video here, end this video, because it's probably epically long already, is I'm going to show you the final schematic and the final circuit board layout with our modifications. I'll explain them a little bit and then what I'm going to do is I am going to then plot these out into the Gerber files and I'm going to upload them uh, to JLC and I'm going to have some professionally made circuit boards made up and then I will build for our next video I'll build the final uh, product and actually have a really nice piece of test equipment for the bench and that'll be the second video so we'll do that real quick and then uh, there you go it works 
And here's our final schematic. Um, not a whole lot's changed, but if you noticed, I swapped these two wires around on this side. Um, that's that was necessary. I removed that one end 914. It's not necessary for there. Um, I added a one meg resistor, just uh, just so we don't let this gate go floating high. Um, really, you you need to kind of have something there to keep any kind of noise or anything from false triggering this gate. So I put that in there and it really made it very stable. Uh, this is no longer plus 5 volts, it's connected to the plus 12 volts bus. Um, there just was too much voltage drop on all this for it to work with 5 volts properly. Uh, what else did we do? Not really much else, that was about it. And if you remember on mine, instead of using uh, the 7805, I actually used one of these little modules here. And I set it very accurately to 5 volts, almost exactly 5 volts. So that, that'll help this reference be a little more stable. Now, speaking of this reference, I just kind of sat down with some paper and scribbled some numbers down. And basically what I did was I interpolated uh, from the 2.5 volts at 0 amps and I went above and below to, as you can see, about 15 amps. Figured out what the voltages were and then kind of figured out what this resistor needs to be in between these, this, this voltage divider to give me the amount of voltage spread that I need for each of the amps. So that's kind of what this was. And the 15 amp module breaks down to 41.67 millivolts per amp. I know that's an odd number. And the 25 amp, amp uh, sensor, which is the one that's being used in this one, is 25 millivolts per amp. So they do have a different scale to them. So they would have different resistances. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'll show you. As I mentioned earlier, using a pot isn't the most favorable thing for this because it's hard for a one-turn pot to be able to adjust those uh, values throughout the range that you need it to be and adjust it accurately. You just can't get enough um, precision with the pot unless you went to like a multi-turn pot or a high precision pot with a big diameter knob on the outside to kind of slow down when you turn it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these resistance values that I'm calculating. I'm going to just approximate it they're not going to be exact. Um, I'm going to use basically what standard resistance values are available and that I have. And I'm going to use this little tap switch I had in stock. It's an old thing I picked up. I don't even remember how long I've had it. It was in a box of parts. And I believe it's like a 15 position tap switch. And all I'm going to do is connect all the different resistors to each tap, tie them together in the center, attach it to the center tap here, and then I'm going to actually connect that um, in place of that pot. So we'll actually have positive adjustments for, the, for your trip point. Now, it came with a really nice little <laughs> chicken head knob, so I'm going to use that too. And it's even scored so that you can cut it to whatever length you need for, the, you know, for panel mounting. So I'm just going to use that. And that's how we're going to set how many amps we want it to trip at. So that's going to make a really neat solution for that. Although you can use the pot, and like I said, by jumpering in that shunt resistor, you can change you know, the, the range of this pot, how it works. And that's another solution if you don't have a tap switch like this. Now the thing i got to do is I have to find another tap switch. I'm going to go through all my junk boxes. <laughs> and I have to get a five position for this here. So we'll see what we can come up with with that. As for the print for the circuit layout, that's how it looks now. It's pretty simple really. And this is actually the Gerber files that I'm sending out 
to print this board and I'm going to print about five of these off and have them shipped out to me. So uh, as you can see <laughs> this board's really been hacked a lot if you look at the back to kind of get everything to work but it does work. So, uh, so we'll get a nice factory made board and we're going to make a really nice and this should last me the rest of my life a nice little electronic circuit breaker. And again, I want to thank Ron Soyland over at Glasslinger uh, YouTube site. He, uh, he came up with this original idea, and I just thought it was awesome when I saw it, and I just had to build one. So thanks again, and thank you all for coming along on the journey on this one. And as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. We'll see you soon. And as soon as those boards, they'll probably take them a, a week or two to come in. When they come in, we'll do the build of the project for part two. And uh, then we'll see what comes up next. And maybe in between, who knows, maybe we'll have another little project in between. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.